Thank you for joining today's webinar focused on navigating early career funding opportunities. My name is Dr. Eric Boone. I'm the director of the NIH Division of Biomedical Research Workforce, which was initiated in 2017 with the mission to develop, maintain, and assess as well as enhance NIH policies and programs supporting innovative training, career development, and educational opportunities to support a more diverse biomedical research workforce. I will be serving as the main moderator for today's event, and I'm pleased to share the format of today's topics. Experts representing various NIH institutions and centers and offices here at NIH have joined DBRW staff to help provide you with a better understanding of how to navigate the black box of NIH and its available programs. There are four different but related topics that will be discussed during today's webinar. Fellowships and career development opportunities, navigating NIH diversity programs, advancing your career through networking and mentoring, and finally, resources to help you and your pathway to success. Following each presentation, we will be addressing as many questions as possible before moving on to our next topic and segment. So why don't we get started? I'll be leading our first discussion focusing on fellowships and career development opportunities, essential tips and other helpful suggestions for a successful application. The purpose of this portion of today's webinar is to provide investigators at earlier stages of their career with helpful suggestions about how to find a scientific home, who and when to talk to when applying for Fs and Ks or fellowships and career development awards and other important information. I'm joined during this session by three of my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Amanda Boyce, Program Director from the National Institute of Arthritis, Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases or NIAM. Dr. Lauren Hill, Deputy Director for the Office of Disparities Research and Work Divorce, Work Diversi Workforce Diversity um, from the National Institute of Mental Health or NIMH. And following the presentations is a Q&A that will be moderated by none other than Dr. Terea Donaldson, Research Training Policy Officer with the Office of Extramural Research here within the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce. So we're gonna start off today's webinar with a session focused on essential information and tips on fellowships and career development awards for first time applicants and others that are newer to the world of NIH. I mentioned the word tips here, and I wanna highlight that any information in orange text in the following slides or highlighted in orange text is considered to be significant tip or information that early career investigators should take note of. Um, as I stated earlier, I will be serving as presenter as well as moderator for this session. And also, as I mentioned, I will be joined by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Amanda Boyce, Dr. Lauren Hill, and serving as an additional moderator for this session, Dr. Terea Donaldson. So this shows an this shows the agenda for this session, which again is focusing on first time and other early career investigators that are relatively new to um, the world of NIH. We'll start off with helpful tips on how to find a scientific home and deciphering the NIH alphabet soup. Um, this will be followed by a discussion of things that are important to know when applying for fellowship awards. And then we will end this session with a discussion on important things or things that you don't know can't really help you when applying for career development awards. And then we will follow up with a Q&A. So NIH is the largest public funder of biomedical research in the world, investing billions of dollars each and every year in pursuit of our mission, which is to enhance health, lengthen life, reduce illness, as well as disability. In FY21, NIH invested just under $43 billion in medical research. Most of NIH's funding is awarded for extramural research, largely through more than 50,000 competitive grants to more than 300,000 researchers at more than 2,500 institutions in every state. As you can see in FY21, NIH invested almost $2 billion in research training and career development opportunities. 
NIH is made up of 27 different institutes and centers, of which 24 receive funding directly from Congress to administer research programs. The Office of the Director is the central office responsible for setting policy for NIH and for planning, managing, and coordinating programs and activities across the NIH. And of course, you see the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce highlighted in the green box to the top left is located within the Office of Extramural Research, which is also a part of the Office of the Director. While there is one NIH, there are 27 different institutes and centers and offices, which means there are 27 different cultures. Each has its own mission, has its own activities, and its own way of doing business. So how does one know where to get started? So most early career investigators, including myself, when I was at that phase of my research career, are a bit anxious about talking with an NIH staff member. You're worried about saying the wrong thing or not sounding like you're knowledgeable, but here's a little primer on key players that you'll be speaking with for the rest of your research career, actually. So we have program officers, scientific review officers, and grants management officers. So program officers are scientists and administrators. They help to identify priority scientific areas. They communicate this information to their peers, uh, to leadership, to extramural investigators. They also manage grant portfolios. Next are scientific review officers or SROs. These can also be scientists and administrators. They manage grant reviews. They prepare summary statements um, as well. And then you have grants management officers, again, who can be scientists and administrators. They help to implement uh, the funding processes, they oversee budgets, and they ensure grantee compliance with NIH policies and regulations as it pertains to budgets within applications or grants, rather. So who should you talk to? Um, so when, rather, should you talk to these individuals where you speak with program officers well before submitting a grant application because they can help you to better understand the institutional um, research priorities, um, which funding mechanisms may be most appropriate for you at this particular research phase. And also, once your application is submitted and reviewed, they can discuss next steps with you if you're not funded or even if you are funded. You can speak to an SRO after your application has been assigned to a review committee. Um, uh, you can, for example, if there's some information that you find that is missing within your application or you need to resubmit uh, or submit supplementary information, you talk to your SRO. Next is the grants management officer. You can speak with them before or after review of your application to discuss any budgetary issues. Let's just say you, um, you change institutions after your application is submitted, et cetera. You talk to your GMO. One of the things that I'd like to get across to this audience, especially earlier career investigators, is the idea of normalizing reaching out. Contact your program officer well before the application deadline. Don't be afraid to talk to them. But what do you do when you do want to reach out to them? You have to give them something, right? So submit maybe a one to two page concept. So what should you include in this concept? You should give information um, about the background for your research and your own background, um, the significance of the problem or the question that your research will address, specific aims. Um, if you are submitting a training or, or fellowship or career development award, talk about your training goals, your mentoring team, et cetera. Also remember that follow-up is needed. Emails get deep. And it's not that we're ignoring you or we don't wanna speak with you. It's just that sometimes people get busy don't think that you're bothering us by reaching out to us again. We're here to help you. It's our job. So now that you're aware of who to talk to and when, how do you find the right program officer and the right scientific home? Well, these are some resources to help you. So one, first talk to your mentors and your colleagues. They've been in research and in this research game for a long time. So based on your research areas of interest, they probably understand who you should be speaking with and when. Next is the NIH reporter tool for funded projects. This can show you lots of information about the types of projects and trends in funding um, for NIH uh, um, grants, uh, grants and applications. Next, uh, you can utilize the NIH matchmaker tool. 
this is a fantastic tool. I call this the plenty of fish for researchers who are looking to find research funding, right? Why do I say that? Because if you insert your specific aims or you insert search, uh, search terms that are relevant to your research, up pop or pops up will be information that's relevant for you. So like, for example, you can find out what other institutes here at NIH support similar types of research that you're currently performing the program officers who have that, those types of research in their portfolios, uh, review panels, um, et cetera. It just gives you a lot of information that can help you with planning your research career. Also check out review pay or review IC web pages, mission statements, and also research priorities. Also review funding opportunity announcements. And you can find those on grants.gov and with an NIH um, guide for grants and contracts. So now let's dig into that just a wee bit more. Speaking of funding opportunity announcements, this is how NIH announces to the public um, about the availability for funding for research in specific areas. You can use information within funding opportunity announcements or FOAs to learn about research areas of interest, which ICs are participating and how to apply for grants, et cetera. A helpful tip here for you is to make sure you subscribe and sign up for a weekly email to receive a listing of all grants and contracts that are available at the NIH. So there are different types of funding opportunity announcements and we'll go through this really quickly. So there are program announcements, request for applications and parent announcements. So program announcements highlight specific high priority areas of scientific interest. They're usually ongoing for at least three years and there are standard receipt dates. Most, but not all ICs participate in program announcements. There are also requests for application. These identify specific research areas. There are specific set-aside amounts, uh, specific numbers of awards that are also anticipated to be awarded. There's usually a single receipt date. Um, parent announcements. This is typically the way that most NIH applications are submitted. Um, they're usually ongoing for three years and there are standard receipt dates. What are key elements within a funding opportunity announcement or FOA? Again, it states the purpose of the program and its goals, the type of award or activity codes, which ICs will participate in that FOA, due dates, um, description of the funding opportunity, award information, et cetera. Another important resource is the NIH Research Training website, and this curates information specific to types of grants. OK, so this is a, a place where you can find types of grants or um, funding mechanisms according to career stage. So if you're at earlier uh, stages of your career, there are certain types of individual fellowships or career development awards that are available. If you're at later stages, there are different types of bars. So you can find so much information on this research training website. We hope that you will visit it. So as I wrap up and my time is nigh, what are my tips? What are my three most important tips? Well, according to this page, maybe four or five that I'd like to give to you as I leave. The first thing is to review IC priorities and goals. They will differ according to ICs. The one thing you do not want to do is to submit a grant application or a fellowship application to an institute or center that is not interested in funding the type of work that you are interested in performing. Learn the NIH application and review process and study successful grant applications. This will give you an idea of how individuals format their research ideas, how they structure their grants, et cetera. Normalize reaching out for help. You're not an island. You don't have to do this on your own. Make sure you contact your program officers early and stay in contact with your mentors. Also sign up for God FOA alerts. I said this was the last thing, the funding opportunity announcement information will be the last thing that I would give you, but I wanted to make sure that I showed you this schematic of funding opportunities according to career stage. Um, this is a resource that will be available to you in the research training booth, so please don't think that you're going to miss out on finding out more information about this, okay? So actually, this is my last slide. Thank you all for your participation, and now I will hand this over to Dr. Amanda Boyce. Okay, I need to get control of the slides here. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Erica, for your introduction to the NIH. 
and hello to all of our attendees. So I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes introducing the four most relevant F fellowship awards offered across the NIH and offer some grant writing advice that aligns with the NIH peer review criteria associated with those FOAs. So I'll start with the Kirstein NRSA awards. You might hear these called NRSAs, nurses, or this is the, the majority of our F awards. And I'm specifically gonna be talking about the F30, the F31 and the F32. These are awarded to pre-doc or post-doc fellows working with mentors. Training can be done at domestic or foreign institutions, but the awardees must be citizens, non-citizen nationals, or have permanent residence in the US. You can perform basic or clinical research on these awards, but you're not allowed to lead an independent clinical trial. Please note, as Erica said, that not all NIH institutes participate in all fellowship announcements. So it's imperative that you contact the program officer before applying. Allowable costs for these awards, including the stipend levels, are released in the yearly notice. So I'm gonna dig just a little bit deeper into each of the F awards. This particular slide covers the three programs targeted to pre-doctoral students. Starting at the top, the F30 is intended for individuals enrolled in a formal dual degree program. This is thought of mostly as MD-PhD programs, but we know that there are other dual degree programs as well, including uh, veterinary programs and dental programs. Uh, for this award, you can apply for up to six years of support, 50% of which must be used to do research. Please note that there are two F30 parent FOAs, one for institutions with NIH funded MSTP programs and one for institutions without MSTP programs. Not Like I said, not all institutes participate um, in these, so make sure that you re reach out to us. This is something you're going to hear frequently uh, as, as the, as the uh, uh, slides progress here, but please do contact us before you apply. The F31 is intended for individuals enrolled in a formal PhD program, and you can ask for up to five years of support. Uh, the third bullet here is the NIH uh, F31 uh, fellowship to promote diversity. This can actually be used for individuals in either a PhD or a dual degree program. And the same timelines um, apply to these. If you are in a PhD program, you can ask for five years. And if you're in a dual degree program, you can ask for six. All of these require a full-time research commitment uh, that's considered 40 hours a week by this by congressional language and they all include a stipend, an institutional allowance, and some tuition reimbursement. There are two programs targeted to postdocs, the F32 and the F99. The F32 allows up to three years of support, while the F99 actually covers the final pre-doc years and then transitions into a, K, uh, a K00, which will cover the first years, few years of postdoc time. The F99 is not an NRSA program, so the details concerning the length of the award and eligibility are going to vary by funding announcement. So for instance, some F99 announcements allow non-citizens with valid visas to apply, which you'll need to look specifically at the announcement for those details. So I won't walk you through the details of this slide, I'll just give you the take-home take message here. And that is fellowship applications have multiple components. They all must complement and parallel each other. And it has to be done in very few pages. So look at all of the areas. These are all, all the sections of the application that you can use. And I'm gonna go through all of the review criteria, um, which, will, uh, which will specifically tell you what you'll need to put in each of these particular components. So listed here are the five core re review criteria for F applications. The fellowship applicant themselves, your sponsors, collaborators, and consultants, the research training plan, training potential, and the institutional environment and commitment to training. In the next few slides, I'll give you some general advice about how to approach each of these criteria. So starting with the fellowship applicant, this section demonstrates your potential based on your academic achievements, your research productivity, and your letters of reference. 
While there's no magic number, in general, the more publications you have, the better. That's not surprising, especially if they're related to your F application. However, make sure to include all of your publications, including ones that you may have had as an undergraduate student, as this will show commitment and trajectory. In addition, describe any podium or, or poster presentations, include, include all relevant awards and achievements, and keep in mind that your letters of reference should be enthusiastic, personal, and clearly detail your intelligence, creativity, drive, and commitment to scientific research. This is hard, but this is not the time to be modest with your achievements. You really wanna sell yourself here. Uh, and moving on to sponsors, collaborators, and consultants, this is your team. So together, they must have expertise in the scientific topic area proposed in your research project and expert experience and success in training scientists. You actually may need a mentoring team to make sure all expectations of a mentor are filled. You'll need a topic area expert with an extensive publication record, someone with success in obtaining peer-reviewed grants, a mentor with experience training people who go on to become independent scientists. Uh, in addition, if you're a clinician working with a PhD, you may want a clinician scientist as a career mentor. The letters of support of these individuals should clearly define the roles of everyone. Um, it's nice to have a very famous person on there, but make sure that that person has a very specific role. Next is the research training plan. The goal is to develop a project that will result in publications, provide you with new skills, advance the scientific field, and launch your career. So we're not asking for much here. You wanna develop a strong, coherent training plan with your mentor, making sure that it's related to, but independent from your mentor's funded grants. We don't want copy pastes here. We want your brain going into this. The plan should be appropriate to your level of experience and your career goals. You want to propose a clear hypothesis based on a solid rationale with supportive preliminary data. Uh, make sure to include pitfalls, alternative approaches, data interpretation, statistical analysis, and future studies. Just as a helpful tip, there are no expectations that, that, that the research can be particularly innovative or risky, um, but because re reviewers would really rather see a plan that's likely to succeed and lead to publications. Uh, and finally, in this section, make sure that you state specific realistic milestones and uh, associated timelines. Uh, next, I'll cover training potential. So the goal here is to acquire new skills and training that will expand upon your previous training. The activities should match your career goals and make you competitive for the next phase of your career. So we'd ask that you describe individualized training that addresses your specific training needs. So that may include additional coursework, opportunities for written and oral communications through courses, workshops, and presentations at the local and national le level. And since many people will be going on to the running their own labs or teaching, also include opportunities to train more junior scientists. It often helps to also include a formal mentoring committee, even if you are a postdoc. Obviously, if you're a pre-doc, you should already have this committee, uh, but it's really nice to have a group of people to help monitor your progress. And finally, institutional environment and commitment to training. Here you'll describe the resources and facilities available at your institution to successfully complete the proposed experiments. But in addition, uh, we would like to hear what kind of seminar series that brings in external leaders in the field are happening at your institution, opportunities for collaborations and, inter and uh, interactions with faculty and students across your institution, and any seminars or workshops that focus on things like career development, grant writing, starting a lab, running a lab, et cetera. There are also uh, additional fellowship review criteria and considerations. Some of these contribute to the score of the application like human subjects and vertebrate animals. Others in theories don't contribute to the score necessarily, but they can actually delay funding if there are any issues. 
And I say in theory, because failure to follow instructions looks like a lack of attention to detail. Number one thing you need to do is follow the instructions. So Erica asked that we provide three take-home tips. As you saw earlier, she wasn't able to hold to three and neither am I. So here are my five take-home tips. Number one, start months in advance. Don't rush this. The NIH review process, once you submit your application, it's gonna take six months. Once it's submitted, you're in for a wait. So give yourself enough time before that wait to put in an application that you're proud of, where all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed, and it tells uh, the story that you wanna tell. And that leads to point number two. Make sure that the application tells one cohesive story. Your training plan has to align with your training goals, your mentor team, must cover all of your training needs, et cetera. It's one story. Thirdly, and I mentioned this in the previous slide, pay attention to details. So this is an example of a few things, things like fonts and error bars and spelling. But the goal here is you want to make the application both pretty and easy to read because that sets the stage for the reviewers, but it also reflects on how meticulous you are, which is obviously something important when you're doing science. Fourth, we ask that you write the application yourself, of course, with the, with the guidance of your mentor. This is your opportunity to experience applying for NIH funding, from reading the FOA all the way up to responding to reviewer critiques. Really absorb this process because it's going to be a key component of your research career. And finally, you wanna to ask to see successful F awards. Ask around within your lab, ask around within your department, you may also have a pre-doc or post-doc group at your institution that's already uh, accumulated these and they can help out. Uh, if you want to start off with the links below, I've included links for sample applications and reviewer critiques to get you started. And with that, I will turn things over to Lauren. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Voice. That was great. Um, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Lauren Hill from NIMH, and I am going to talk about uh, Career Development Awards, or what we often refer to as K Awards. And Dr. Boyce has teed this up wonderfully for me because much of what she just spoke about with respect to the different um, review criteria for fellowships, a lot of that is very, very similar um, when you're writing a K Award. So let's get going. Um, so Career Development Awards, or also known as K Awards, are designed for individuals with um, a doctoral degree who have demonstrated some potential or some interest in having an independent uh, research career award, but who need additional experience to establish or sustain an independent uh, research program. So K Awards provide three to five years of salary support, and importantly, they guarantee some substantial period of protected time for you to engage in research and research related activities to make that transition to research independence. So not every NIHIC or institute and center participates in every available K mechanism. So as we've already said many, many times today already, it's important to look at the website, do your homework ahead of time, and make sure that your scientific home, the institute to which you plan to apply, will support the K mechanism to which you plan to apply. And ICs may have and do have different specific policies um, pertaining to different K awards. Um, and you can view the, uh, the K funding opportunities ahead of time. K awards are in intended for those who are in an initial phase of a research career. So people typically um, apply uh, at the very, very late postdoc or typically the early, early faculty phase, uh, assistant professor phase. Um, certain institutes and centers have restrictions on how much postdoc experience you can have to be eligible for a K. Not all of them do. Um, I'm from NIMH and NIMH, we have a restriction of no more than six years of postdoctoral experience before your um, K eligibility runs out. 
Um, they're for people who require additional supervised or mentored uh, career development um, beyond the postdoctoral period in order to make that transition to research independence. And they really are for people who want a career as an independent scientific investigator. These are not for clinicians who want to do a little bit of research on the side. These are for people who really want research careers. Um, K's come in many flavors. NIH supports um, K's for mid-career people. I saw some questions in the Q&A about institutional K awards like KL2s and K12s. Um, these are sort of the standard um, mentored career or K awards, the K01, the K08, the K23. We also have a K25, which is a quantitative award. Um, the K01 are for folks who have um, uh, PhDs that are not clinical. Um, the K08 and the K23 are for people who have uh, clinical doctorates. Um, so what you want to do is you want to go on to our uh, K kiosk and um, see which one is appropriate for you and for the, for the, the type of um, doctorate you have and also the type of science that you want to, um, to pursue in your research career. The K99 is technically a postdoc award. Uh, as Dr. Boyce said, then it trans transitions you from the postdoc into an ROO. One thing to be mindful of with the K99 ROO is that transition is not automatic. Different institutes and centers have different ways of reviewing um, the adequacy of the um, package that you're offered when you get the job offer for the ROO. Um, at our IC, that review is quite rigorous um, because we want to see you get a very competitive package. You're coming with money um, and we want to make sure that you're poised well for success. So the take home message there is it's, it's not automatic that there is a, an internal review process between the K99 and the ROO, but it can be a great um, mechanism to kind of uh, push you forward to independence. And all, okay. In terms of eligibility for K awards, um, you must be a US citizen, non-citizen or permanent res resident, except the K99 in many instances, there is not um, a, US, a citizenship requirement. Um, again, check to make sure. Um, you must have a research doctoral degree for the K01, clinical doctoral degrees for the K01, K08 and K23, or rather the, the K08 and the K23, you can, you can apply, if you have a clinical doctor, you can apply for all three. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the K25 is a, a quantitative mechanism. We at NIMH don't support that, but the other ICs do. Um, you are ineligible for a mentored K if you are a current or former principal and get investigator of essentially an R01 equivalent or some kind of major research project grant. Characteristics of mentored K awards. They are uh, three to five years in duration. Um, different institutes and centers have a default. I have here that four is the default um, for NIMH. That is not necessarily the case any longer. And again, it varies from IC to IC or and depends upon what your scientific focus is. Um, the minimum research effort, and this is true, is 75% effort. They are not renewable. Uh, salary support varies by institutes and center. The maximum is $100,000. Um, and research support, you also get research support, and that is up to $50,000. As you can tell, that's not a lot of money. Um, it is a mentored award, so we expect your institution and your mentors or your sponsors, actually, to help with the cost of conducting your research. Um, the K99 duration is for up to two years, plus additional um, independent years, up to three years for the ROO phase. The support during the K99 salary is up to 75,000, research support up to 20,000, et cetera. And the take home message here is that Ks can and do differ by institute. Please, please reach out and speak to your program officer before applying. Um, 
Dr. Boyce walks through these uh, review criteria for um, fellowships. They're very, very similar for K awards. Um, again, as Dr. Boyce said, they should the, the K award should really hang together cohesively for the candidate. The um, reviewers are looking for your previous training, your productivity, your letters of recommendation, um, your um, the potential for independent research career, um, your research plan, your career development plan, all of that should hang together and tell a cohesive picture. Your mentoring team should have complementary skill sets. So you shouldn't have, you know, all mentors with with one area of expertise and, and none of your mentors in another area in which you want training. Your mentors should not only have um, outstanding track records as scientists, they should also have very strong track records as mentors um, at the phase of the career development where you are um, when you're applying. And the institutional commitment also should be strong. A K award should never um, be content, um, or let me say this again, a faculty appointment should never be contingent upon a K. Um, that should be um, something that you have. Um, you know, that that's that's a given um, as you're getting your K. Um, here are, I only had three tips. So, you know, evidently I'm the only one who's following directions here. Um, what I do want to say, um, and it's, uh, is, is, um, as I said before, is to make sure that your K application, your K story is a cohesive one, one that hangs together. Um, the, the, all the pieces, the, the plan, the mentors, the actual research, the applied research experience you're getting, the didactics that you're proposing, the um, conferences you plan to attend, they should all fit together. I have uh, a sample table in the bottom right. Sometimes when people um, ask for technical assistance, I say, well, put it together in a table and start with your career development goals. Maybe your three to five goals that you're planning for your K and make sure that whatever you're planning, you know, whoever your mentors are, whatever courses you're going to take, whatever um, conferences you're going to go to, whatever papers you're going to write and be specific, um, make sure they align with those career development goals. You shouldn't have something dangling out here, um, you know, and, um, you know, checkbox, and you can see where you may have gaps or may, where you may have too many things. Um, also, turn your training gaps into training opportunities. If you don't have as many publications as you might want, or or that would poise, uh, position you well to, to uh, write an independent R, make that part of your training goals. Be specific about what papers you're going to write. Where are you going to get the data? make that part of, you know, because they're going to see the gaps. So don't try to hide the gaps, um, fill them in, turn those gaps into opportunities. And your mentors should be mentoring. The expertise that your mentors bring to your K should be evident. Reviewers will pick up on that. If certain publications are, are missing, certain areas of the literature are missing from your um, background, they're going to go, where was Dr. So-and-so? Why didn't they catch that? And, and you're going to get dinged for that. So although you are writing it yourself, your mentor's expertise should be evident. Um, their commitment to you should be evident. So that's, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn it back over to Erica. Thank you so much. So this brings us to the Q&A portion of today's uh, uh, portion of our webinar uh, for fellowships and career development awards. So we're going to ask for Dr. Terea Donaldson to come up on camera as well. And we have received many, 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 many questions. So if we do not get to your question, please do not be offended. Um, we've got about five uh probably about five minutes or so um, for Q&A at this point. Okay, thank you, Erica. So um, I would like to start off with the questions that were upvoted from the audience. And one question in particular 
Uh, for K-level applications, how important is it to have mentors at your institution rather than external mentors who may have more appropriately matched context expertise? Is there any general rule on what the blend of intramural versus extramural mentors should look like? Lauren, you want to take that first? I think, look at Amanda. Amanda looks like she's no. <laughs> chomping at the bit. <laughs> How about you start, Amanda? <laughs> no, I was going to let Lauren go. No, I'm happy to talk about it. And I will I will tell you, this is just based on all of the reviews of K awards that we've heard over the years, just to give you an idea. It doesn't happen frequently, um, but sometimes it does happen. And I always say that, like I said, you're building a team here, whether it's an F or a K. So sometimes you do have to reach outside of your institute to get the right kind of expertise. However, you definitely want someone locally who can take care of you, right? You're going to need somebody who's got funding in lab space and wants you working in their lab, right? So you have to have that local person, but I, I would encourage you to reach out. The only issue there is um, make sure that they put it in their letters, that they are committed to the relationship, that they have a very specific role, maybe build in travel um, if you can. In the time of Zoom, though, I'm not sure that's totally necessary anymore, unless, of course, you need to learn some, some uh, wet skills, some wet lab skills. Uh -uh, I'll let Lauren go. <laughs> Ditto to what you said. Um, and I, I and I think um, it's an opportunity to to sort of distinguish between a mentor and a sponsor, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the person who is providing that kind of infrastructure and those types of resources, space, money, animals, access to a clinic, et cetera, that's your sponsor. And oftentimes that sponsor really needs to be local. Um, it's unlikely that you would have access to those resources from somebody who's um, at another institution. And, you know, you want to be uh, set up for success. Exactly. Um, and just to to catch on to the tail end of that, as my eight year old niece always says, make it make sense. Right. So any component within your she says it all the time, any component within your application should make sense or be in alignment with what you state are your research and your career related goals. Right. So if you have to have a mentor that is located at a different institution, let's just say that you changed institutions, but you have a major mentor that is at your previous institution. Just speak about that plainly and directly within your application. Why is that person there? What do they contribute to your career growth and trajectory? Um, you bring people in, mentors and sponsors. A lot of times people like to bring people in with big names because they think that it's going to help them to get funded, right? I think that the better applications are the ones where they make it make sense. Why are these people a part of your research team? Why are they on your team supporting your growth? Because this is your application. It's not necessarily about them. They're adding to what you are, are, are indicating are your research and your career-related goals or dreams. Okay. Thank you all. So the next question, is it possible to break down the K awards and talk about which mechanism is best for which position slash stage of postdoctoral training? and what career goals each mechanism is best suited for. I'm, I'm not sure I understand okay. the question, but perhaps the best answer to that is a, a referring to a website where, or the K kiosk where you can look at, um, I think the, the dimensions there are, um, what type of doctoral degree that you have and the type of research you want to conduct. I am I getting nods? Yeah. And then it's yes. it's in the it's in the um chat there. I think that's the best place to start. I, I think that that is the best place to start. And thank you very much, Dr. Lauren Ulrich, for providing the link to the research training website um, because it can provide you with uh, information on the different types of activity codes that are available um, at NIH. And they're also broken out according to career stage. So um, I think as one of the resources in the resource in, in the booth and also as a part of my part of the presentation, I included that schematic 
of um, mechanisms um, that are available at NIH and they're broken across career stage, really and truly as, as what, like Lauren said, um, you look, you take a look at each one of those and you see what your, or you think about what your own career goals are, what your own research goals are, and then you move on from there. Another thing too, is talk to your mentor talk to your program officer or use matchmaker to find out who might be your likely program officer to kind of give you guidance with regards to the type of um, activity code or the type of career development award that you might want to apply to. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate, I think the first thing you do um, is run your aims through matchmaker to, to get your program match. Because right now, every FOA, let's take the KO one specifically, has a, a, a table that has all of the institute specific eligibility criteria, salaries, et cetera, in it. And the KO one is the most broadly used thing that I think I've ever seen. Some people have time limits, some don't. Some require you to be junior faculty, others won't let you if you're junior faculty. So that that you really should. I mean, start with like, I think I want to do a KO one and then just reach out to the program officers. Some ICs use the KO one as a, a diversity mechanism and others don't as well. So really the best bet is is digging into those tables and, and see what will work for you. Yes, and what Dr. what Amanda and both Lauren really were speaking to as well is those IC specific tables that gives you all of the I say special sauce or secret sauce with regards to what institutes and centers are really looking for when they're looking for individuals that they feel might be the best match or candidate for the um, um, for the mechanism uh, that they're seeking to fund. Okay, thank you. So next question, are three-year K applications often successful or do they risk being perceived as low impact or lower priority than five-year applications? I can take a stab at that one and then turn it back over to Amanda. Um, <laughs> I'm going to quote Erica's niece. Make it make you sense. You stole my line. I was going to say <laughs> that. You have to make it make sense. Make it make sense. No, um, in all seriousness, um, mentored Ks are really, really tailored for the applicant. So if you real if you need three years and you can launch into an independent research career in three years, that is fantastic. Write for three years and go for it. Um, it, it it don't just linger on, you know, and the same thing is true. If you need five years, write five years, justify the five years, don't write four years, and then, you know, sit around saying you're going to write papers for the fifth year. That That's not good. Um, so, you know, I, Amanda, you may have a different perspective, but I think it just really needs to fit. Yeah, you're, I mean, I, th I always encourage people to think of a K as one person's work at you for a full-time effort essentially for a year. So the scope of the science has to fit in there. And then, and then of course, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of time to do the experiments, write the papers um, and get going. So it, it make it make sense. <laughs> so, I would also absolutely. like to point out, don't fudge. Don't, don't try to fudge it. Don't try to stretch it out because you think that you will be more of a priority if you write for a five-year K as opposed to a three-year K. A reviewer is going to be able to see through that just like a clear glass, right? They're going to see that this person doesn't really need, you know, five years for that. Right. Probably only need three years for that. So speak to what you actually need to support your own research trajectory and growth. Absolutely. And, and talk to a program officer. Did we put that as one of our top three tips? That should have been number one. Oh my one. gosh. That should be like, you know, when I <laughs> when I give these talks, <laughs> when I give these talks normally, like in real life, I go to the podium and I say, okay, so if you guys want to start texting, you know, do an email, whatever, just listen to this one thing and then you can do that. Contact a program officer early and often. Now you don't have to listen to the rest of the talk because yeah. that is really the most important takeaway message from any of these talks. I did see within the Q&A box, though, because I was kind of snooping as you guys were talking. What do you do when your program officer is not responsive? That's a great question. Um, yeah, be persistent, right? Because we are busy. Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, we're people. So some people are more responsive than others. Some people are more warm and fuzzy than others. But it is our job. Um, 
And then you can try pinging other people, you know, other people at the IC, other people in the division. Um, hey, I haven't heard from so and so. Yeah, you know, are they out sick? Like, you know, who could I talk to? You know, that would be my my suggestion. I don't know if y'all have other ideas. No, I agree. I mean, I'm not a part of a muscle team, so you can always reach out to my teammate. Uh, most institutes have training officers or a training division sometimes, and they can certainly answer questions about the mechanisms, maybe not the science so much, but, you know, there's usually, depending on your question, and if you're saying, I'm not hearing back, likely that person will just be able to answer all your questions. Yeah, I'll also say this is an opportunity for portfolio or funding diversity, right? So we've been talking about matchmaker, matchmaker, matchmaker. I think that most people say I'm an IAMS researcher, I'm an, M an NIMH researcher. You're a researcher that has various research interests and career goals, right? So just like we don't invest all of our money in just McDonald's, what if people stop eating meat, right? You know, our investment is going to tank. So just like that and our funding, our, our financial portfolios, we should be thinking about our our funding portfolios in the same way. There's so many different other institutes and centers that are funding research that is has some sort of similar vein in line with what your research is. So this is an opportunity for you to utilize Matchmaker and see who else is out there that might be um, might have the ability to fund you. So right. next next question. So what's the difference between a mentor and an advisor advisory committee in terms of K application? and responsibilities during the award period. Should I repeat that? Um, I think that in the in two sessions, they're gonna talk about mentorship and sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So should we kind of put a pin in that one until then? We don't wanna steal some of their thunder. Sure, sure. So let's move on to a question that I thought was interesting. Um, if you apply for the K award during your postdoc and are fortunate enough to receive that award, do you need to stay with that university? Are they obligated to take you on as faculty? How does that work? No, all of us shaking our heads. No, I mean, <laughs> what your university does and what the NIH does are totally independent things. I mean, we have some rules, but um, they, they're free to hire or not hire as they see fit. Um, so, I mean, other than that, I don't, I don't know. What was the yeah, thing? I I would not recommend doing that. I because the institutional commitment is a review criterion. Um, it, it's so important. So I would wait to get to where you're going to land, right? So I would wait until you get that faculty appointment and then apply for the K. I wouldn't apply as a postdoc planning to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, now, if, yeah. if life happens to you, though, and you find yourself in a situation where you must leave your current position, this is a great opportunity for you to work closely with your mentor, possible, but also with your program officer. So, you know, wh while there are some hard and fast rules here at NIH, sometimes there is that wiggle room, and we do understand that sometimes life dictates your career choices. So, if if you don't remember anything else that we say, talk to your program officer. They really are your research best friend. So I think that um, this is the close of our session so we can move to the next. I would like to thank the presenters today. And for those who questions that we have not you know, uh, answered or addressed, uh, we will have the booth today uh, starting at, uh, I believe, 3.35 into 4.30 if you have additional questions. Also, you can reach uh, us at NIH uh, training at NIH.gov. And that is our training mailbox for uh, other questions when uh, in regards to uh, training. Thank you. And we'll put that in the box too. Thank you all so much. So now we will move on to our next session. Um, thank you all. Thank all of the presenters, our moderators, and thank you for attendees for participating in the session. This was really a great conversation. And I'd like to introduce our next topic and our next expert staff. Um, so this presentation will focus on navigating NIH diversity programs. So during this session, we will discuss 
or they will discuss, our experts will discuss how diversity supports the NIH mission, the evidence base supporting the designation of certain groups as nationally underrepresented in science, uh, the NIH programs designed to increase or enhance diversity, and where you can find additional information about diversity programs. The current session on navigating NIH diversity programs will be led by Lisa Evans, Scientific Workforce Diversity Officer in the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce in the Office of Extramural Research, and Dr. Lauren Ulrich, Program Director, Office, Office of Programs to Enhance Neuroscience Diversity, or OPEN, um, with the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, or NINDS. Lauren, Lisa? So on behalf of myself and Lauren, we want to welcome you to this session. I also want to acknowledge Drs. Allison Lynn and Desiree Salazar, who you will not see on the screen today, but they are behind the scenes helping us to answer questions in the Q&A box. In some respects, they are the real sheroes or sheroes of this session. Before we get started, we want to acknowledge that this is a lot of material to cover and we may not get to each question um, during this brief time frame. If your question is not answered here, there are two sources of information that can help. The NIH Extramural Diversity website, which is extramural-diversity.nih.gov. And as was previously discussed in the last section, um, the NIH Research Training and Career Development website which provides many FAQs on diversity. So I'd like to take a moment to tell you how this session will be handled. I will start out by giving an overview about why diversity matters and its relevance to the NIH mission. The groups, as Dr. Boone said, that have been identified as nationally underrepresented in the scientific workforce and how underrepresentation is determined at the national level. Lauren will give you an overview of select diversity programs by career level and identify some of the criteria that you need to meet for each of them. I will then come back and very briefly talk to you a little bit about the resources that are available to answer additional questions. We will not be responding, at least Lauren and I will not be responding to questions until the end of the presentation but you can certainly enter your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. Allison and Desiree will answer um, these questions as we go in an effort to save time. So let's get started. So why is it that NIH is interested in diversity? In some respects, we should start with the last bullet because our agency's mission is focused on science and we are always interested in producing the best and most innovative science. You should know that there is quite a bit of research about how diversity improves educational environments and how diversity improves team, well, how diversity um, res results in better and more innovative products. And that's, that's the team science approach. So NIH stands at the nexus of both considerations, education and science. This slide reflects an excerpt from the Notice of Interest in Diversity, which talks about the NIH mission and why diversity is important as well as the groups that NIH has identified as nationally underrepresented in science based on a rigorous labor market analysis. Now I have to stop for a moment and say one of the first questions that we get about the notice of interest in diversity is why other groups like sexual and gender minorities or individuals who may identify as Middle Eastern or North African or MENA are not specifically mentioned in the notice. The intent of the notice is to simply identify the groups that we have and a robust evidence base to support the designation. That does not mean that there are not other groups that might be underrepresented nationally or at the institutional level. 
This slide reflects a biannual report that is published by the National Science Foundation, which conducts a labor market analysis to determine the groups that are underrepresented in the science and engineering workforce. And just one caveat I would like to mention is that when we talk about underrepresentation, <clears throat> we're not talking about low numbers of certain groups, either at the national level or at the institutional level. The concept of underrepresentation, again, reflects a labor market analysis that goes beyond that consideration. As I mentioned, um, we have an extramural diversity website, but we put this slide in to remind you that everything that I have covered in this part of the presentation can be found under the diversity matters tile, which is on the far right of the screen in red. Um, and so you can find all of this information there, um, literature uh, about the groups that are underrepresented, et cetera. So now um, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren and Lauren will talk to you about a few diversity programs that we have at the NIH. Remember, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and we will have them answered behind the scenes to the extent that we have time to do so. After Lauren concludes, we will have a few of the frequently asked questions or the, um, that we found in the, um, in the Q&A box and we will try to address those. So Lauren, are you ready to take it? Yep, I'm ready, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so today I'm going to cover um, selected NIH diversity awards. And so I am I have listed here um, a schematic of our potential awards from the K through 12 all the way through junior faculty. And um, it's important to note that just because an activity code is on this list, it doesn't mean that every NIH institute participates. It may just be one that has this. And it also doesn't mean that every single one of these programs um, that have this activity code are diversity targeted. So you have to check both the institute that you're interested in and whether this particular flavor of the funding opportunity announcement is diversity targeted or not. But if it's on this list, then there is a diversity version of the program somewhere out there that at least one IC supports at this moment. Um, but this is always in flux. As you heard, um, you have to reach out to the program officer at the institute that you're interested in applying to um, in order to uh, be sure that what you're applying to is you know, appropriate for you and your situation. So at the very bottom, you can see that we have um, our institutional, our 25 awards, and then we go up through the supplements. We have some individual awards for graduate students, transitional awards, postdoc, all the way to junior faculty. So I'm going to go through each of these one by one. So the um, the maybe the most famous diversity program that we have at NIH, and certainly the most flexible program, is the Research Supplements to Promote Diversity. And these are additional funds that are added to an active NIH grant. So usually it'll be an R01, but there is a whole list of um, grants that the mentor can hold that are eligible for a supplement. So check the FOA if you don't necessarily have an R01. Um, and the mentor will put in an application to support a diverse trainee in their lab. And this can support everyone from high school through junior faculty. And it is administratively reviewed. So unlike most NIH grants, this doesn't go to a study section. This is reviewed by the program officers at the NIH Institute. And every institute, um, I think every institute participates in this program, if not the vast majority of them do. But they all um, implement it just a little bit differently. So some have specific deadlines, some have a rolling deadline, um, some want to see specific things in the application. It really um, varies a lot. So definitely um, check out the, um, the specific IC that holds the grant that you want to add the supplement to. Next. 
Next, we have the Diversity F31, which was mentioned earlier. And this is a, a fellowship to support graduate students from diverse backgrounds. And I think it was also mentioned earlier that individuals can receive up to five years of aggregate NRSA support at the pre-doctoral level. Um, okay, I'm getting a uh, <laughs> request to speak a little louder. So let me, apologies, is that better? Zoom turned down my mic for some reason. Um, okay, so individuals can receive up to five years of NRSA support at the pre-doctoral level. So this would be your T32 if you're appointed to one of those, plus the F31 time can be up to five years for the, for the F31. The R36 is um, an R grant, but it is for graduate students. It is the Dissertation Research Award. There are just a few ICs that support this, um, but it is to support doctoral candidates for up to two years for the completion of the doctoral dissertation research project. And it actually provides some funds for the, um, the completion of the dissertation research and not just the um, funding to support your stipend. The F99K00 was also mentioned earlier, and um, this provides funds for the last one to two years of graduate school and four years of postdoc. So it's an F to K bridge program. And it also, like the K99R00 that I'll talk about later, um, requires the submission of a transition application. So the F99 phase is reviewed in a study section, um, same as, as any other NIH grant. And when the once you reach your PhD defense, then you submit a new application that is reviewed by the program officers. And that will outline the four years of the K00 research. And you'll have more information. You'll have chosen your postdoctoral mentor, and you'll have um, more information about the research project that you're proposing. And then once that's administratively reviewed, then the second phase of the K00 is awarded. The K99R00, so this is a transition from postdoc to tenure track faculty. And there's quite a few um, diversity focused versions of this um, program. It supports the last one to two years of postdoctoral training and uh, three years of faculty through the R00 phase, so a K to an R bridge program. The K22 is um, very similar to the K99 R00. It's a mentored transition award, and it will help postdocs transition to assistant professor and initiate an independent research career. So it also has a phase one and a phase two, and some um, institutions use this as a diversity targeted transition award instead of the K99. And we've had a lot of talk about the K01 um, so far this session. The shorter version is that it's used very differently by, by the different ICs. Um, for all of them, it's going to be a mentored career development award that's going to provide protected time for three to five years of research career development. But other than that, the eligibility varies a lot by ICs. So some use them mostly to support postdocs. Um, and some it's more of a transitional type award and some it's really you apply as a junior faculty. So it really varies a lot. And then lastly, um, I want to mention our research awards to promote workforce diversity. So we have R01 and R21 awards that are specifically to enhance the diversity of investigators conducting research within the different in NIH institutes and centers mission. So there's several ICs now that have these diversity R01s and diversity R21s. So I highly encourage you to, um, to look for those and see if the institute that you're interested in uh, participates. Then 
the we also have institutional awards that are focused on diversity. So the R25 is a research education award. Another um, activity code that comes in many, many, many flavors. So um, the diversity versions of this um, really span everything from K through 12 all the way through junior faculty. And of course, different ICs are going to support different career stages. But in general, these are institutional awards that support educational activities to complement or enhance the training of the workforce. So a lot of times these are going to be mentoring activities, professional development activities, research experiences, and, and things like that. that they're not going to replace a T32 or, or a grant like that, but they're going to complement those, um, those awards. And these can be local, they can be national, um, but because they're institutional, you don't apply as a trainee to NIH to get on these awards. You would apply to the people who, um, the PIs who were awarded the awards. So they're all managed locally. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to tell you about a few resources that are available. You're muted, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm, we're gonna just hammer again on this um, extramural diversity website. Um, simply because it has a lot of information, not only the tile that um, I mentioned earlier, which explains about why diversity is important. It also um, contains a lot of information about how to navigate your career pathway. Um, it also, in the blue tile, um, talks about building participation, some strategies that PIs may use, and also, we have a section on reports and data. So it is a wonderful um, resource that you might want to take a look at. In addition to that, it's been mentioned, um, as in the previous part of this webinar, that the Research Training and Career Development website is also a resource that's available. Um, please note that the Research Training and Career Development website has a set of FAQs, which you can see at the upper right hand corner of the website. There are specific FAQs that have to do um, with diversity. So if you have any questions about that, you may want to refer to those diversity FAQs. In addition, um, we it was also mentioned by Erica that there's a, a place where not only can you sign up to receive notification of published grants and contracts, but you can also search um, through our website and identify those opportunities as well. And in addition to that, um, I think that it was uh, Dr. Boone who talked about um, Matchmaker and all of um, these uh, fun this functionality, matchmaker, um, searching for NIH grants by um, location and topic is located on Reporter, which is a public database that contains a lot of information about um, NIH and our awards. And that's located at uh, reporter.nih.gov. And so uh, that ends our um, research portion of um, resource portion of the presentation. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Lauren um, and she's going to pull up some of the more frequently asked questions in the chat. I've been answering as well, um, which is how I was a little distracted when we started this, but. Anyway, um, Lauren, go ahead, go right on ahead. Sure. So we have a couple of questions um, specifically asking about, you know, who qualifies for diversity awards. Um, so do you want to take that, Lisa? 
Yes. So um, as I had explained in the text, in the Q&A box, someone was asking a question about um, what are diversity programs? So diversity programs are programs that are designed um, in, in, in terms of their intentionality to make sure that um, NIH is recruiting individuals from those groups that are identified in the Notice of Interest and Diversity for these particular programs. So NIH is interested broadly in diversity, but when you see a diversity, what, what's called a diversity program, we are really interested in the recruitment of those individuals from underrepresented backgrounds. So I think that's that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, and so um, I think kind of similar questions, maybe there's some confusion around what it, like sort of how you would know if it's a diversity program or um, sort of what is meant. So is this on top of another funding mechanism? Is this a separate program? So mm -hmm. how does that work? So they, this may sound just intuitive, but if it says diversity in the title, it's a diversity program. Um, we do have um, institutes and centers that have, for example, a K01 or an R01, as, as Lauren mentioned, that focuses on diversity. But I would suggest that you read the funding opportunity announcement, particularly the section of the announcement that talks about the purpose for the grant. And that will really tell you um, what it is, what type of candidates um, that, the, that are being solicited for that particular announcement. Yeah, so um, just to sort of restate what you already said, um, maybe in some different words in case um, it's not clear. There, um, there usually is for all of these programs, what we call a parent announcement. So you might hear us talking about the parent K01 or the parent K99. And what this means is it's sort of the general, like generic one. And sometimes ICs will sign on to that one and they'll have maybe another version that has something specific to them. And it doesn't have to be diversity. It can be pretty much anything. Um, so for example, NINDS, we don't um, participate in the parent F32. We have our own special F32 because we have certain things that we want to emphasize or certain review criteria that we're interested in. And diversity FOAs um, act very similarly. So there's a parent K01 that an IC may or may not sign on to, but then there will also be a diversity K01 that an IC might issue. And so they're separate programs. It's not just something attached on top of the parent. It's gonna be a completely separate FOA. Um, when you're searching, you can put diversity into the, um, the grants um, search box that Lisa talked about earlier, and that'll pop up all the different diversity awards. Um, but certainly it'll be in the purpose and usually the title as well. That's how you can tell if it's a specific diversity targeted award. Um, let's see. So we have um, a question. Does the review or funding process differ for the diversity awards from these parent awards or the general awards? Um, so, and I'll say, yeah, go ahead, Lisa. No, start. no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll say that it, it kind of depends. Let's say the, the general process is going to be the same. So they're sent out to um, the summary or the study section for review. And, you'll, you know, that whole process is the same. But there may be different review criteria within the FOA. So, for example, for the Mosaic K99 R00, which is a diversity targeted program that's run by NIGMS um, or organized by NIGMS, but a lot of different ICs participate, um, there are quite a few specific review criteria related to um, diversity and diversity efforts that the candidate may or may not have um, participated in. So, in that sense, the review is a little different because reviewers are answering different questions about your application than um, they would for the parent. 
Um, but that's the case pretty much for all FOAs. There's the potential to have different review criteria in um, in that that section. Uh, Lisa, did you want to add anything? No, um, it just that this is the reason why it's so important to carefully read um, the funding opportunity announcement. And if you have questions to reach out to the um, program official who is normally identified at the back end um, of the announcement. So you can directly find out what that institution is looking for in their, um, in their programs. Um, okay, so there's another question about, you know, what is the difference or the benefit of applying to a diversity award versus a parent award? Do you want to take that answer or do you want me to do it? Um, I, you could do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I think it really depends on the FOA. So sometimes the diversity award is very different than the parent. There just isn't a parallel award offered by the IC. Um, and so you really, it's really a no brainer. If you are, if you fit this, um, uh, the what the FOA is asking for, then why not apply? Because there isn't sort of two different options. Sometimes there is sort of, you can choose one or the other. So for example, the diversity F31 and the parent F31, they're pretty much identical. And the only difference is one is diversity targeted and the other is not. And in that case, um, it's really up to you. If you identify with the mission of increasing diversity, if that's something that um, appeals to you, that's one way for you to sort of identified to the IC that you fall into this category. And different ICs will use that information very differently. Um, at NINDS, for example, you know, we may sort of try to um, give you additional information about other opportunities that you may be eligible for. So for example, the diversity F99 that we participate in, um, we might email that information out to all of our diversity F31 applicants just to say, hey, this is something that you might also be eligible for and interested in. And if you apply to the parent, we might not know that you're eligible or interested in, so um, you wouldn't get that information. The other I, ICs may, may use that information very differently. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out to you, there was a question um, in the Q&A box and it was sort of along the lines of whether the, the competition for diversity awards is different. Um, they are all reviewed um, by, rigorously reviewed by um, uh, reviewers. And so in that respect, the review is different. It's just that may, perhaps the criteria um, that's being used is a little different between a parent award and a diversity award, but they are all rigorous, re rigorously reviewed within um, the IC. Yes, and um, I think different ICs will approach these things differently, um, but at least at NINDS, for most of our training awards, we don't have a set budget. And so we always say, you're not competing with other people because if you get a good score, we'll fund you. And so I, I try not to, I try to discourage people from thinking about it in terms of like the competitiveness mm -hmm. generically, but really focusing on you putting together the best application that you can, that is the best way for you to get funded um, and not really think about it in terms of how many other people are applying or how many other people might be funded because that in the abstract might be, um, you know, something to consider, but when it comes to your specific situation, um, it's out of your control. So the best thing to do is to just put together the best application you can. Um, let's see. In another question. Um, so there's a question about citizenship requirements for diversity programs. Do you want to talk about um, 
the reasoning behind that? Yeah, that's not, I don't believe that's within our control. So um, for the most part, you either have to be a, um, a citizen, a US citizen, or someone who um, has a green card. So um, that, and that comes out, I believe, and I could be wrong, Lauren, um, that, that that comes from our, out of our funding authorities. And so um, that's why you will see that limitation. Um, even in some of the, the uh, training programs, they will say that, um, you know, unless it's an extraordinary circumstance, the individuals who are identified for this, uh, these programs should be U.S. citizens um, or uh, have what's commonly called a, a green card. I don't know if you have something you want to add to that, Lauren. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing I'll say that's when it comes to diversity programs, the um, underrepresentation data that we use to, um, you know, that, that Lisa was talking about from NSF is measured relative to the U.S. census and U.S. population and also sort of the U.S. educational system. So a lot of times um, when we're talking about diversity programs, that's another sort of reason for the, the citizenship requirements. Yes, that's that's true. I wasn't thinking of it from that perspective, but you're absolutely correct. And we also um, frequently get questions about, you know, subpopulation. Is my subpopulation underrepresented um, uh, within the biomedical workforce? But if you go to that NSF report that I was talking about, it does not break out the groups. Um, so for example, under the racial and ethnic category, it doesn't uh, go into subpopulations, for example, of Hispanics. It's not asking about um, or reporting on the presence of Cubans or Mexican Americans um, in the uh, the scientific or engineering workforce. So we don't, and and we also at NIH do not have the capacity um, currently to collect that kind of information, subpopulation information. So we really wouldn't know if a subpopulation is underrepresented or not. Another question, does the K-22 require you to already have a faculty position to apply? I can take that one. Um, the It really depends on the FOA, so <laughs> I feel like a broken record, um, but I'm gonna say probably not. So for both the, the K-22 and the K-99R00, these are transition awards, right? They're taking you from postdoc to faculty. And normally with these transition awards, it is not expected that you have identified where that faculty position is going to be, that you're coming in with um, a postdoc, a strong postdoc project that you're finishing up and a plan for um, you know, going on the job market and identifying your, um, your future research. And then you, know, you have some aims about what you'll do when you get to that faculty position, but it's sort of expected that you're going to be applying for the job after you've gotten the phase one of the K-22 or the K-99 phase. But of course, all of that depends on the specific FOA that you're applying to. So I would always recommend that you find that and read it and reach out to the program officer of that FOA if you have any questions. I also saw another uh, question in the Q&A that, that I thought was very interesting. And it is the question about whether we have diversity programs that focus on uh, not only individuals, but organizations. And it's interesting to note, if you look in the NIH guide prior to, I think maybe last year or the year before, we didn't have programs that specified, for example, um, that they were interested in funding minority serving institutions. Um, that has been sort of um, uh, a recent phenomenon. Um, but you will see in some of the funding opportunity announcements that um, particular, in, instead of using the, the term minority serving institution, you will see some FOAs that talk about um, institutions that have a historical or current mission to educate individuals from underrepresented backgrounds. Obviously, minority serving institutions fall under that umbrella. So, um, so there are 
programs that are uh, looking to increase diversity within um, the institutional setting. Exactly. Um, let's see, there's at least is there one last question that you see in here that you think would be good to, to answer? Well, I don't really see one without that would not require us going into a whole lot of detail. But um, again, if you have questions, I would strongly suggest that you look at our FAQs um, and also reach out to the program officials. And, and one other thing I do want to point out, if you go to the extramural diversity website, there's a contact us link at the bottom of the page, and you can send an email question there as well as to the research training and career development mailbox. Yeah, so I, okay, I'll just pick this one last one that I think I can do quickly. So it says that it seems the K-22 and the K-99 R00 are very similar and can I summarize the high level differences? The short answer is no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it really it really depends on the FOA because there are so many different versions of the K-99. There's so many, um, I think maybe there's only one K-22 left, but the best thing to do is to just look and find the FOA and read it and reach out to the program officer and they can guide you on your exact situation. So we can wrap it up there. Thank you all so much for um, attending this part of the presentation. And definitely, um, if you have additional questions that were not answered in the Q&A, um, feel free to contact us through the Extramural Diversity website or the Research Training and Career Development website. Thank you. I am muted, and now I'm unmuted. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lauren, for an informative discussion on NIH diversity programs. I would now like to introduce our next topic on advancing your career through networking and mentoring. I've very much been looking forward to this portion of the webinar, so I hope that you're going to join as well. So during this session, uh, our presenters will break down some important points about mentoring, what you should know before beginning a mentoring relationship, best practices for finding and keeping a good mentor and how to develop your networking skills. This informative session will be led by Rosalina Bray, extramural staff training officer within the NIH Office of Extramural Research and Lynn Morin, evaluation and research training policy officer within the NIH Division of Biomedical Research Workforce, which is located in the Office of Extramural Research. I think that they are rare in the go. They've got their uniforms together, their headpieces, and a great presentation. So I hope that you all enjoy. Thank you so much, Erica. And yes, my name is Rosalina Bray. And joining me today, officiating this game, is Ms. Lauren, Ms. Lynn Morin. Hi, Lynn. Are you excited to get this game started? So in this session, we're gonna talk about advancing your career through networking and mentoring. Now I'll tell you somewhat, somewhat about the game plan. On today, we're gonna to talk about self-assessments. We're gonna talk about developing your plan for advancing your career. We're gonna share a little bit about mentoring versus sponsorship, which you've heard a lot about already on today, but we're gonna break it down even further. And we're going to talk to you about how to network with intentionality. I'm going to leave you with some great takeaways for your next game. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lynn to talk about self-assessment. Thank you, Bray, and welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I want to start off this session by talking about something that we feel is an often overlooked step to being successfully mentored that of the self-assessment. So I wish I had thought about this as a poll question, but it's going to have to be rhetorical and more reflective. So how many of you have taken a self-assessment? Why did you take that self-assessment? Was it mandatory, required for a class? And what did you do with that information after you took it? Did you use it to plan your career goals? If not, why not? So self-assessments are tools and they help you identify growth opportunities 
They provide you information about your career interests, your values, your aptitudes, and behavioral tendencies. I think one good example of a self-assessment that a lot of people know about is the Myers-Briggs. For those of you who don't know, the Myers-Briggs is an introspective questionnaire that gives you information about how do you perceive the world and how do you make decisions? Um, so we'll touch briefly in, in a resource section at the end about some other examples, but you can really Google this term and find the myriad of different types of self-assessments out there. So find one that fits your needs and, and maybe not as expensive, um, or you can take advantage of anything your institution might offer. Um, so the So I've said before, the self-assessment can help you identify skills and competencies you may want to acquire and can identify development needs. And I want to be intentional and say this is more than just those skills and capabilities that are involved in your day-to-day -day being in a lab. This also includes those soft skills like how to manage people, how to have difficult conversations, so it not only benefits you to determine, say, your preferred communication style or whether you prefer to work in teams versus independently, it really helps you gain a greater appreciation for your authentic self. And the self-assessment will enhance what will be your relationship with a mentor. And those identified development needs will give you a starting point to developing the mentoring contract, which is something we'll also talk about later on in the talk. So the self-assessment is your first step in developing your game plan. Now I'm gonna share a little bit about developing that game plan. This is going to help you set a course. First, specifically, we wanna talk about your plan development and the parts of that plan development. It's going to begin with listing your specific goals. Then after you have these goals, you want to develop a pitch to describe what you want. You want to also identify people, places, and lastly, you wanna be able to assess your strategy. So at this time, we're going to talk about your goals. And I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn. Sorry, I can't multitask. I was muted. Um, so identifying goals. As I mentioned, self-assessment is the good first step in helping you identify those goals. It can help you identify where do you want to be in three five, or even 10 years to where do you want to be as an adult? So the self-assessment can be used to develop the individual development plan or IDP. Now, a lot of you probably already know what an IDP is. You've seen them. NIH strongly encourage them um, for trainees and fellowships. Um, so it's basically set up to help you identify those short, mid, and long-term goals. It can be used to establish the partnership that you create with your mentor. It gives you both the goals to work towards and the starting point. So some institutions have sample, a lot of them do actually have sample IDPs on their website. Some of institutions even require IDPs as part of their programs. But again, you can always Google the term individual development plans. Don't Google IDP because you'll get something completely different. Um, to find one that suits your needs as there's honestly very different types and variety out there. The important thing to keep in mind about the IDP is that it, it's by no means a static document. It should be reviewed at least yearly but more often if as you face challenges and you need to make course corrections, it's a dynamic living, breathing guide. So now let's look at the other components of your plan development. Now, once you have you identified your goals, 
you want to begin to think strategically about how to describe your plan and then to implement your plan. And that is where these strategic components like people who you're associating with or that you hope to meet or to network with, your pitch and places matters. What people? Well, these are individuals in your field, both nationally and internationally. You need to know who they are. In addition, you can find people through the centers here at the NIH, centers and ICs here at the NIH, such as program officers, program directors. In addition, individuals who have received grants in your field or your discipline know them. If there are individuals who have received faculty and research awards, you wanna know their names as well. And lastly, you can find out the names of individuals who are on agency grants and or program officers for grants from different agencies, foundations, and groups. Next, let's talk about your pitch. Your pitch is what you want to deliver as a message about who you are to others. Often people refer to this as an elevator, elevator pitch. In this pitch, you want to be very, very clear about your vision. You want to provide a succinct intro to who you are, and you want to narrow down your why or your ask of the individual you are pitching to. And finally, before you, in the conversation, you want to have a closing that includes a follow-up. Indeed, it's also important to show gratitude when you're delivering this pitch and after you deliver the pitch. So remember to say things like thank you or to send a follow-up message if you shared information, contact information. Next, we'll talk about places. So along your strategic um, journey of trying to move forward your career, you'll want to think about what professional conferences you want to attend and utilize them to share information and to gain information and knowledge in your field. You also want to attend seminars, exhibitions, um, special sessions, and these can be involved in your career and outside of your career uh, field of interest. In addition, scientific meetings, scientific discussions, not to just know that these things exist, but that you are actively deciding which ones to attend and mapping it out um, as a part of your strategic plan. So I hope these strategies will help you and you become more intentional about incorporating this into your ultimate course plan for moving forward your career. Lynn. So we're excited about this next topic, mentorship versus sponsorship. Please know that you'll need others on this journey and it begins here with your mentors. So we have a polling opportunity coming up. We wanna know a little bit about you. How many mentors do you currently have? So the chat, the poll is up and those of you who see the, see the poll, would you please share your answer? You have a few seconds. Thank you, Bray. While we're waiting for the poll answers, there was a question that came up between um, a question about multiple mentors and, and advisory committees. And the, that's actually gotten a, quite a few hits. And I'll just address that quickly. There was one question specific to the KO1. So there, multiple members are, um, are multi, multiple mentors are allowed and they're even encouraged. And to go back to what Erica said earlier, you need to make it make sense. You want to find mentors that are going to meet your needs. If you feel that if you want to be that R01 researcher, you need to find uh, mentors that have those R01 grants that can guide you on that career. Um, if you know you're going to have to take a teaching load and that's something that you feel daunted about, find mentors who can help you. But don't just focus on those pieces. Think about mentors who, if you're a, a, a a woman in science trying to have a family and 
trying to figure out how to balance all of those different aspects of your life, find someone that you feel is, has been successful in that. So by all means, please look for multiple mentors as you see fit and will help you achieve those goals. And also the question um, asked about the advisory committees. I would say that if you think about it as mentors are personal to you, advisory committees tend to be those associated with programs that can help programs succeed, but your mentors are, will be personal to you. So I don't know, did we finish the poll here? I don't see results. <laughs> Let's see the poll results. Well, I hope that most of you have more than one mentor and Lynn has already identified reasons why. They may not, one mentor may not be able to help you with all of your goals. And so we're gonna talk in just a moment about the difference between mentorship versus uh, sponsorship, but we're going to first learn a little bit about the quality of your mentorship. How would you describe the quality of your mentorship? Is it high, good, moderate, poor, or bad? We're going to give you an opportunity to answer that question. And then we're going to um, then we're going to see what your results are. Maybe rhetorical for us for now. I think there's something happening with the poll, so we're going to continue. So think about, thank you so much. So from our previous, from our question on how would you describe the quality of your mentorship? It seems that the majority of you, so this was the previous question that the majority of you have more than one mentor. So the previous question was about how many mentors you have, the majority of you have more than one mentor, one to two, which is great. So we're gonna go ahead and close that poll. And instead of doing the next poll, which we said was just rhetorical to think about, we're going to go on to the next topic, which is mentorship versus sponsorship. So again, we want to be very specific in explaining to you the difference between mentor and sponsorship. Your mentors are individuals who have knowledge about your field and or whatever you've contacted them for, for helping you along with your goals. They have the experience, they have the expertise, they've been there, they've done that, and they can advise you succinctly on what to do next. These mentors are going to also be supporting you because they have they have um, value in this relationship as well. You add value to them by giving them an opportunity to share their lessons learned. And of course, they're sharing it back to you, values you. They can provide you guidance. They can give you feedback on your goals. And sometimes they serve as coaches. Now, there are some instances where your mentor may be your sponsor, and we're going to talk about when that happens. But our advice to you is to have a mentoring contract. That mentoring contract is going to help when you, as an exit strategy, when this mentor relationship needs to end or has to end, but it's also going to set boundaries and expectations about the support that your mentor will give you and also how you will interact with your mentor. Now, sponsorship or sponsors are individuals who are leaders in an area who can advocate for you because they trust your ability. And we're saying leaders, but that they can also be individuals who sit in a particular position or have connections in a particular area, and therefore they can advocate for you. This will help you in your next pro uh, promotion and or move you into new areas that you have been looking to, to settle in. These sponsors will help you elevate your visibility with others. They help you to expand your network. They can also champion your work. And lastly, they can remit, recommend your involvement in committees and or for positions and or opportunities. Now, Lynn, do you have something to add more concerning mentoring contracts? So basically, I think the important thing about a mentoring contract and what Brace said is really important is that notion that people tend to to see mentors as, and mentoring relationships as infinite. They don't have to be. The mentoring contract is important because you can identify exit strategies. One, you know, you should always plan ahead if things don't go well. And I think that was also a question um, in the Q&A is that what if I have a poor mentor? 
Um, hopefully these mentoring contracts, if you've thought enough ahead of time, will give you places where you can think about your exit strategies, but it doesn't have to be for a poor relationship. You know, the mentors are helping you achieve a goal and you can create something in the contract that would say, you know, oh, I've reached this goal. So, you know, here's my exit strategy. I need to move on. If it's a poor mentor, then, um, I think the person in the Q&A had suggested they leave their institution. That's kind of a, a huge step um, and something that may not be something you can undertake, but finding other mentors within your institution could be something that you do. But I think that mentoring contract is really important. And we do provide um, some resources in a, in a link that will give you example of mentoring contracts. But again, you can Google it and find different varieties and flavors and things that work for you. And Lynn, where I've found people to go wrong is they believe that their mentors should be sponsoring them, that they should be helping them get their next position, that these individuals should be speaking up for them on their behalf. They can do this. However, it's going to be your own individual work, your ability to go out and network, your ability to share good products, to participate in things around your field, um, to speak up for yourself that are going to bring notice to you from others. And you want people to notice what you're doing from all aspects of what you're delivering um, to the field that you are a part of. And those individuals are going to begin to see your ability beyond your mentor, mentor having to have that responsibility to be the person that not only pushes you forward, but finds you your next opportunity. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about networking. Ray, before you get to networking, oh, sorry. Yes. Before you get to networking, there is a question in the uh, Q&A that I'd like to quickly address. It says, if you are applying for a non-mentored K-22, do you only include sponsors? What is the difference at NIH between a mentor and a sponsor? Do you need both? Keep in mind that at NIH, the sponsor tends to be the individual who is going to support you in the lab. Um, they can be one and the same person, but they can also be different people. You can be in somebody's lab um, taking advantage of, and I don't mean that in the negative connotation, but, but getting access to the resources in the lab, some of the funding that's available in that lab, or you know the, the models or the techniques, those will be your sponsors. Those will be the ones that are, are supporting you in your research endeavors. They don't have to be your mentors. Sometimes it's nice if they're a well-funded you know, individual, a PI that's gotten good funding from the NIH. That's always good mentoring to have. They can help you navigate that black box that is the NIH funding opportunity. So I just wanted to address that really quickly. Thanks. That was good, Lynn. Thank you so much. Now, networks by design, we're talking about being intentional and your connections do matter. So I believe next we are going to be talking about um, your networks and I believe there's another poll. How well do you feel you network within your field? Think about that question and please participate in the poll. How well do you feel you network within your field? Very well is a five. Well enough is a four, could be better, only when forced to, and I don't network. A few more seconds. All right, we're going to close the poll and see what the majority has selected. Could be better. Great. Thank you so much. So now let's talk about it. If your networking could be get better, how do you network with intentionality? So Lynn and I are going to discuss with you a few things you need to be mindful of. When you're networking, you do want to be strategic. However, you want to be authentic as well. Recall when we talked about having your pitch, your pitch may be that you need more mentorship and you find someone who you believe could be a good mentor. So have your pitch ready. This is going to help build your network once you add your mentor, new mentor into your network. And remember, 
This was definitely strategic, but it was also a need, a part of your individual development plan, and you went after it. So now your network has expanded. As you build that network, you're going to find other people in places and in positions, and you want to be authentic when you approach them as well. But remember your pitch, which talks about your why. So your ask becomes intentional. And you're building this network because it relates back to the goals that you had on your individual development plan. And that's the reason why we're going after it yard after yard. And last, we want to say this, you want to value others. You want to esteem them because you admire them and you are inspired by what they've done and what they will do. And they want to contribute to your success as well. So please don't treat people in your network or those who you approach as though they have no value other than getting you to your next level. So therefore be authentic, be honest, be truthful, have integrity in your approach and enjoy your networking experience. Lynn, do we have any questions about networking? I see, I see nothing specific about networking now. There's still some questions about um, mentoring, but I think we've addressed those. Well, that's wonderful, wonderful, because at this time we're gonna take a, give you an opportunity to add more questions and we're gonna leave you with some takeaways. Okay, so keep those questions coming in the chat, there's a really long one and I'm, I have to, let me, <laughs> let me get through this and then I'll see if it's, um, it's, it's about a hard money teaching assistant, TT assistant professor position, planning to apply for K. Okay, let me, let me address this next session in terms of the timeout takeaways. So as we reach the end of our session, we basically want to summarize what we've been talking about and some of the points that we've made, um, here right now and give you some next steps that you're going to be taking away with you and doing after you leave the session immediately. Um, so first, we want to say that the first key step in finding and taking is finding and taking the self assessment, then using that self assessment to create your individual development plan. So Bray reviewed the importance of developing your pitch to ready yourself for the introductions you'll be making to new potential mentors, being strategic in identifying where are the best places to find the mentors that you need and that can help you achieve your goals. Use one of the many examples that may exist on the web to develop a mentoring contract. Keep in mind that not all mentoring relationships have to be infinite. You can have a mentoring contract that will identify an exit strategy when your goal is reached or if you feel things are not going as well as they could be. And remember to revisit your mentoring contract, your IDP, and even your self-evaluation. Um, as situations change in your life, your goals change. As you achieve goals, you should be setting new goals. So it's really important to keep revisiting all of these things. Increase your visibility. Learn to network strategically and with intentionality remembering to be your authentic self. And we can't say it enough, but it's important to reevaluate and assess your strategies and plans along the way. That was wonderful, Lynn. Now we wanna leave you with a quote um, from Bobby Unser. Success is where preparation and opportunity meet. And along that journey, we wanna leave you with some resources as well. And those resources are going to be shared with you by Lynn in an upcoming session. She's already shared with you some examples of some assessments. And since you'll have access to this presentation, you can check out some of the links that we've shared for possible assessments. Also, we are sharing with you some links um, through our um, the, the materials that will be shared later for sample mentoring contracts and where you might be able to find them. But of course, you could also just Google for those. And the NIH's career development resources you'll learn about shortly. So then I'm going to turn it back over to you for any questions coming in the chat and then to finally close us out for this session. 
Thank you, Bray. I, there is a question that I would personally love to hear your answer to. So how can we network and build meaningful relationships? Any suggestions for people who are not networking savvy? To build a meaningful relationship, you have to have something in common. And whatever has brought you and these other individuals are the individual together, that's your first, um, your first area where you have something together meaningful that you both share. You can start there with conversation and or getting to know more about that person's passion or interest in that area. And so that's one way to build rapport. After you built this rapport uh, with the individual you hope to network further with, you want to also ensure that they are available and ready to be able to connect with you again. And that is where we shared earlier that you want to have a, a follow-up. And if that follow-up is not um, existent or can't happen, then this may end that networking relationship or experience, but you wanna keep those individuals in mind for later. And you grow these relationships just like you were watering a plant. So you need to make sure that you're connecting, you're following up, and if you hear something significant about the other person that's happening, you want to send them a thank you, a congratulations message, something to keep them attuned to who you are, and they will recognize that you are attuned to they are who they are. And this is a method for you being able to cultivate the relationship in your network. Great points, great points. And we do have a follow-up. So what are some approaches or pitches for finding sponsors? Is it appropriate to email people asking for them to sponsor you? It's not appropriate to email someone to sponsor you unless it is that you have been directed to do so. Because you can always lead in with, my mentor has suggested that I contact you. If you need sponsorship and it's a need that you have for someone to, um, to, to involve you in an opportunity, such as a committee, that seems appropriate as well. Because if they're already a part of what you wanna be associated with, that's an entry point. And so that would be appropriate. But if you don't have any relationship and you're not quite sure, I think your email needs to begin with just sharing about who you are first before you put in an ask to say, can you sponsor me? So there are, there are ways and timings for this and you'll get the feel of it, but know the, the why, what's my intention here? And can I get it through others who are closer in the network, in my network, or do I really need this individual? And then you plan out a strategy for involving that, that individual who could potentially be your sponsor. Thank you. So, so I'll, I'll handle this next question because it's asking: Are sponsors considered a formal role, or people, or people in your network who can promote you? So, the term sponsor has multiple meanings. In a grant relationship, as I mentioned before, the sponsors are the ones who support you with your research. They um, are the ones whose lab you're in. Um, they can provide you with little seed funding um, to conduct some research of your own. That's sort of a more formal sponsors and it's related to, to the quote unquote grant world. But there's also the sponsors out there who do tend to put you up for positions and you may actually not know you have sponsors you might never know they've put you up for an opportunity. Uh, somebody could be talking with a colleague and say, you know who you need to think about um, either hiring or um, using in this role or asking to help you out with that. And they will give them your name. And you might never know that that's how that person got your information. So there's two different ways you can look at sponsors, the more formal supported in your lab and the more informal that you actually may never know that somebody is holding you up for positions or opportunities. Thank you, Lynn. That's so important. That's really why you need to think about your professional brand and also being visible with others and ensuring also that what you produce is of quality so that others can take interest. So here's an interesting question. Does the NIH host any networking opportunities for early career researchers? And, and I'll ask my colleagues in DBRW2 to, to chime in with this, but the, the short answer is yes. 
We have um, the National Research Mentoring Network that NIH supports. They will often hold mentoring sessions. The, um, the seminars that we have on a monthly basis, plus the uh, February seminars, there are um, opportunities for networking. We are hoping, actually Bray and I are hoping that we can take this networking and mentoring session to a um, longer session or another session at the February um, conference and as a lounge to give people the opportunity to sit and talk with us and perhaps, you know, mentor with some of the people who are are in that and finding people who are at similar levels or maybe that next level um, so that they can get advice from them and how they succeeded in getting their grant application or, you know, other things that they can provide advice on. So keep an eye out for, you know, things that NIH does offer. And a lot of times you can look on um, the NIH websites. Um, and thank you, Dr. Boone, for putting the NRM and NET um, address on the chat to everybody. So um, but yes, we do often have networking events and also the different institutes and centers or ICs will have opportunities at conferences that they support. So I actually used to be with the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and we would hold networking events within the um, Research Society on Alcoholism meetings. So look for opportunities there as well. I know we're doing a lot of things virtual, um, but there's still opportunities to do virtual networking events. And also once we start phasing back into um, in, in-person and live events, that there'd be plenty of opportunities as well. So I also want to remind you that we have um, the 3.35 to 4.30 session at the booth that some of us will be there answering questions as well. So if we didn't get to your questions here during the sessions, then please definitely visit us at the booth. A lot of great questions, Leanne. So we're going to adjourn now in just a moment. So yes, yeah, so now I want to talk, turn it back over to Erica Boone, who will close us out with the resources section. Um, I think I can, ah, I forward the slides. Erica, thank you very much. And we've got a touchdown for our <laughs> session. Well, uh, we are almost finished with today's presentations, um, but before um, I wrap up with resources, I would like to give a hearty thank you uh, to Lynn and uh, Rosalina for an awesome and very enthusiastic session focusing on mentoring and networking. Um, now, before we end, we all know um, that we've heard so much information today and there's been so much to absorb, but I wanna leave you with some useful resources that can be important for you as you navigate your research career. And during the next few minutes, I'm gonna share some important websites, resources, tools, um, et cetera, in order to be able to help you to do that. So here we go, important resources to help you navigate your early research career. So um, I'm gonna focus on several key issues that you should, uh, well, there are several key issues that you should be considering before, during, and after your application is written. And the resources that I'm going to be sharing with you are going to help you with navigating some of those issues. And I'm also going to point you to other resources for developing your application. So in particular, I'm going to be sharing links and websites to help you navigate your career, finding a scientific home. Um, we've also included links to help you to prepare your grant applications, um, uh, uh, important sites where we have FAQs written, as well as NIH policies and policy updates, where we list those uh, here at NIH and how we notify you of those here at NIH. Um, we've also mentioned several resources that um, I'm going to re-mention again today, but that's just because they bear mention again because they are just so very important. So there are several key areas that we're going to address today, and that includes career guidance, like finding a scientific home and a PO. So again, we're going to go over the NIH. NIH data book, NIH reporter, NIH matchmaker tool, because I want for you to take these resources and utilize them to help you in order to do some planning for your career, get better clarity with regarding uh, the planning of your research career. 
We're also going to talk about um, how to apply, including NIH forms and applications, which ones should I be using and where do I find them? Also frequently asked questions and then also uh, NIH policies that are important for your career. Where do we list these? So uh, once again, we've talked about this, but this is a snapshot of the NIH data book. So within NIH report tool, um, see the link at the top part of the screen there, you'll find the NIH data book, which provides summary information on extramural grants and contract awards, grant applications, um, the organizations that NIH supports, the trainees and fellows supported through NIH programs, and the National Biomedical Research Workforce. If you want more information on trends and NIH funding, this is where you should be looking, right? So as you see um, on the left side of the slide, information is shared in a tabular form on research grants, SBIRs. You can find information on success and funding rates, funding trends by career stage, gender, statistics on graduate students that are supported by NIH funding, postdocs, et cetera. Also on NIH Reporter, you will find the NIH Matchmaker Tool. As I said before, this I call this the NIH Plenty of Fish for investigators um, uh, that are looking for NIH funding because it shows you information on the types of research that NIH funds, who's funding it within NIH, et cetera. So how do you use it? You enter search terms that are relative to your research interests or your research specific aims, and up will pop information on which ICs are supporting uh, similar research to your own. So this helps you to see which of the other ICs are also um, su uh, supporting the research that you're interested in by what activity codes it is uh, um, supporting uh, this type of research, whether it's an R01 or a, a K08 or a K01 or whatever it might be. Um, but it also gives you additional information on study sections uh, that are reviewing these kinds of applications, program officers who have this kind of research within their portfolios, et cetera. It just has so much good information there for you, and I hope that you're going to take some time to explore the matchmaker tool. So this is just another snapshot of the matchmaker tool. Remember a second ago, I said that you can see um, this is this is an example for research that uh, research for ICs that fund research on radio tracer imaging. So here you can see the institutes and centers that are supporting research in that area, by what activity code, the study sections by which these applications or in which these applications are being reviewed. And then below, it also gives you an indication of the applications that were actually awarded or funded by which institutes, by what year, et cetera. So how do you use this information? Let's just say, that you are conducting research utilizing some sort of specific radio tracer, blah, 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 right? If you know that this particular institute and center funded tons of research in this particular area in the last four or five years, you might want to reformulate some of your research ideas so you're not submitting the same old thing to the same old institute. They're not going to be interested in that. They've already funded a lot of research in that area, right? Unless after you talk to your program officer, they say, no, 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 this is a high priority programmatic research area. Please do submit that application. You might want to utilize the information that you're gaining from the matchmaker tool with the information that you receive from your program officer to better formulate and target your specific aims. Um, that's another snapshot. Matchmaker, you've seen it. All righty, how to apply grants and funding. So this is a great site that houses lots of helpful information and suggestions to help you with preparing your, your grant applications. Um, also, it gives information on how to find the right forms because you don't want to utilize the wrong forms. Uh, so I think we're going into forms G at this stage. So you don't want to utilize form D in order to submit your applications. But if, you're, if you go to this 
uh, site here, the link is at the top right of the page, you will always know what are the right forms um, that you should be utilizing in order to prepare and then write and submit your application. There are also helpful videos and FAQs to assist you and you can see our friend here in the middle of the screen. Uh, you can click on that link, how to apply. You can watch that video. You can also click on the FAQs to find really important information or frequently asked questions that folks ask when they're trying to submit their applications. All right, um, how did we already talked about how to submit your application before, or how to apply and talked about the forms. Again, this is uh, um, this screen shot here um, is really focusing on NIH application forms. So if you see on the right hand side, you see the kinds of forms that you should be submitting to submit, let's just say, for example, a career development award, a fellowship application, um, an, a, a, a research project grant, et cetera. So this application form site um, has, or library rather, has really helpful information on which current forms, the instructions you should be utilizing in order to apply for this particular, for any um, application, or I'm sorry, for any uh, funding opportunity. There are also, again, helpful videos and FAQs on the site. As discussed earlier, you should really, I strongly urge you to subscribe to the weekly email digest from the NIH Guide so that you can receive weekly updates on current NIH funding opportunity announcements. Remember, funding opportunity announcements are the means by which NIH announces um, the areas of research that they're going to be supporting within the extramural community. So you want to make sure that you're getting up-to-date information on a regular basis. So make sure that you use this link here that you see here on the slide in order to subscribe to those weekly updates on funding opportunity announcements uh, from the guide. You can also get them on grants.nih.gov. That's it. Next, um, the NIH Extramural Nexus provides regular updates on NIH grants policies as well as activities that impact the grants community. So in addition to providing news, in addition to providing events and resources, uh, the Nexus is also the home of the Open Mic blog, which is published by Dr. Michael Lauer, who serves as the Deputy Director for Extramural Research here at the NIH. You can find a myriad of blog posts from Dr. Lauer, um, whether it's on uh, early stage investigators and funding trends, or whether it's on um, uh, DSMP, uh, whether it's on whatever it might be, whatever's on the mind of researchers, he's probably got a blog that's out there to address it. So make sure that you stay on top of the hottest news coming out of NIH by subscribing to the Extramural Nexus and the Open Mic blog. Get that new news. All righty. Um, next, I'll tell you a bit more information about other important items that you should know, including about early stage investigator policies, um, published NIH notices, um, our extramural diversity website and diversity programs, uh, research uh, training and career development programs, the loan repayment programs, and also giving you a tip on a really awesome NIH podcast that I know about. So who are ESIs or early stage investigators? So um, early stage investigators are individuals who have completed their terminal research degree or the end of their postgraduate clinical training, whichever date is later, within the past 10 years and have not successfully competed for um, a, a PD or as a PD for a substantial NIH independent research award. So that's the vast majority of you individuals that are on the call today. So NIH is committed to addressing challenges faced by researchers as they begin their research careers and have developed several policies to assist early career investigators in transitioning into their independent research careers. So there are several different benefits to being an early stage investigator or ESI. First, um, NIH has developed several funding opportunities that are specifically targeting early stage investigators like the DP5, the DP2, 
as well as several R01s that are targeting early stage investigators. Second, ESI R01 equivalent applications that uh, receive meritorious scores are prioritized for funding by institute and center receiving those applications. So you get a little bit of a bump up. And lastly, ESIs that experience a lapse in their research or research training periods or periods of less than full-time research effort during their ESI period may apply to receive an extension of their ESI period so they can lengthen that time frame where they're eligible to apply for spe specific awards uh, from NIH that are targeting early career investigators. Oh, and you see in this, the screenshot here, we have um, our uh, 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 one of our websites is devoted to um, describing policies that impact early stage investigators. So you should definitely um, click on the link that's at the top right of the screen here, um, and you will be led to um, policies that are relevant for early stage investigators. And I do want to take a moment to say that this uh, slide deck is available to all attendees as a part of the research training booth. So if you don't have it yet, go to the booth and get this. This is a part of the resources that are available for you. So you don't have to worry about writing things down. And I know that that is probably frustrating for you because you've spent all this time taking notes and now you find out that you didn't have to do that, right? All right, NIH regularly publishes policy notices that are relevant or are of relevance to the NIH community. For example, what's the latest on K99R00 extension, I mean, extension eligibility uh, due to COVID? What are the newest grant application forms? What's the latest on COVID flexibility, on biosketches, et cetera? You can find this out by receiving um, the notices that are published on a regular basis from NIH. So NIH communicates all of this information in various ways, including via notices that are published within the NIH guide. Um, you can also subscribe to receive um, the latest notices each and every week. So you can subscribe to almost to receive information on almost any topic uh, relevant to the NIH community via the NIH guide. Again, the NIH research training website, you've seen this like 10,000 times a day. That's because it's very important that you check out all of the resources. So you can use the NIH research training website to find information on career development awards, fellowships, um, extramural diversity, and more. Um, it's got helpful infographics on different research trajectories, funding opportunity announcements, according to career stage, helpful FAQs, information on ESIs, et cetera. It's a really great website that's of significant use um, or value rather for early career investigators. I'm expecting that we're gonna have a bump up in, in our visits to the site after today, at least I hope so. So this, again, is a snapshot of the NIH Extramural Diversity website. You've seen this presented during the NIH Diversity Programs portion of the webinar today, but it really bears another mention. Not only does it have helpful information on why diversity is important, but information on how to navigate career pathways, diversity-targeted funding opportunities, reports, and data, and more. So please check out our Extramural Diversity website when you have a moment. It can be of extreme value to you. Got questions? You do, because you guys have been asking them for the last two and a half hours. You got a lot of questions, and we're trying to get to them as much as possible. But um, if we haven't been able to, some of your questions may already be answered in our FAQs. So as you see here on the top right of the screen, there's a link to, oh, actually, I didn't put the link in there. It's just got the research training uh, ask questions of, um, uh, sentence there. But what we can do is provide in the Q&A the link to our FAQs on our research training and career development website. So I hope that one of my colleagues will put that link into the Q&A for me. One last important tip. You know me by now. I say it's one last important tip, but I probably have a couple of them up my sleeve right here. But you're going to love it. Oops, I forgot the transition. Here we go, FAQs. One last tip. There we go. Now we're all caught up. Got student loan debt. Many of us on this call either had it or we have it currently. Also, are you conducting research at a nonprofit institution? 
Well, the NIH LRPs or loan repayment programs are here to help you. So if you are a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, I'm, I'm getting my two minute uh, reminder, so I got to wrap it up here. But I want to share this information with you about the NIH LRPs. There are six different subcategories for the NIH LRPs. And I want to wrap up by saying that there are some really important takeaways with this program. So um, you can receive up to $100,000 in student loan repayment over two years, depending on your debt level. Um, we cover most of the federal taxes that result from getting that NIH LRP. So you don't get this award and then you also get hit by a fantastic tax bill by Uncle Sam. Um, initial contracts are for two years, but you can apply for one or two year competitive renewals for as long as you have eligible student loan debt and as long as an NIH institute or center wants to support you. One of the great things about the NIH LRP LRPs, which I can never say enough about, is that you don't have to plan additional research aims in order to apply for the NIH LRPs. You literally tell us about what you're already doing in order to advance your career. These applications are reviewed, and then the NIH LRP pays back your student loans to your loan servicers. There's no better bargain. There's no better deal out here. So please take advantage. Um, uh, the link to the NIH LRPs is in the chat. It is 3.30, they're about to yank my cord here, so I need to hurry up. This again is another snapshot of funding opportunities by career phase. Now, while we did not hit along all of these research opportunities during today's webinar, please, please, please review this. Take a look at this. Where are you in your research career? Take a look at those mechanisms. Describe, I mean, or talk about your talk about them with your mentor. Talk to a program officer. Talk about your eligibility. Talk about your specific games. This document here can help you um, to understand what mechanisms or what activity codes are relevant for you at this point in your research career and which ones you can use as you plan the future of your research career. Now I'd like to leave you with this awesome, awesome podcast that I know about. I'm giving you some secret sauce here. So several NIH ICs have additional awesome resources in addition to their websites. So for example, several have awesome podcasts. So my favorite is the NINDS Building the Nerve podcast, which is co-hosted by one of today's webinar speakers, Dr. Lauren Orridge from NINDS. As the tagline says on the Building the Nerve podcast, we know that navigating your career can be daunting, but we're here to help. It's our job. So seasons one, two, and three can be found on podcasts on Apple, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And you see the link there at the bottom left of the screen. And with that, I will say thank you to our presenters. Thank you to our moderators. Thank you to our interpreters. You guys rock. I've been watching you the whole time. Thank you to everyone who has attended today's webinar. We sincerely appreciate it. As I said, we are sincerely here to help you. If you have questions, please reach out. I hope that you found this webinar today to be useful. And with that, I will say thank you and good afternoon.